shooters are a great genre with tons of classics, but a few stand above the rest. There are three games that define shooters, and today we'll be going through them. We're not going to take these games in any specific order. The first game I'm going to be talking about is Iconic. It's a type of game that changed everything about shooters. The franchise is still one of the most popular in the world. And that game is Call of... Nope. Just kidding. Doom. Doom is an old game. It's too old for me to have played it very much. This is one of those answers that's kind of straightforward, but I had to include one, okay? Doom is a first-person shooter, but like a really old one, because the game doesn't even let you aim up. You ran around vaguely 3D levels and killed monsters and opened doors. Guys, this was peak gaming in 1993. I wasn't alive, but I'm sure it was. Really though, Doom blew people away. It pioneered what shooters actually were. There were really cool weapons, and some of these even hold up today as being fun. The levels had a lot of depth and required you to actually think rather than just running in a straight line shooting everything. It honestly might be harder than most modern shooter campaigns. Doom is the first FPS. Wait, no, Wolfenstein was the first FPS. Wolfenstein doesn't make the list though because it's a little too basic. And it's missing some of the things that Doom innovated. Doom is basically the father to all FPS games. The single player mode of completing levels in a sequence that forms something of a story was pioneered by Doom. People bought PCs just to play Doom. It's been released about 3,000 times on every system imaginable. A lot of other influential single player shooters from GoldenEye 64 all the way up to Uncharted 2 can find a lot of their DNA in Doom. Move through levels shooting enemies, get cool guns, solve simple puzzles to open doors and shoot more enemies, repeat, etc. It also had multiplayer. Online multiplayer in the 90s. This game created the arena shooter style of multiplayer. It was fast paced and you would run around collecting power ups and stronger weapons. This type of game was huge in the past. You had GoldenEye and Perfect Dark on the Nintendo 64. I'll, honestly, Nintendo 64 might be the GOAT console, but let's not get too distracted. It's also followed up by Unreal and Unreal Tournament on PC. Eh, those games are kind of dead, but they're directly in the lineage of Doom. You also see Doom's DNA in Halo. It had similar weapons, it had a power shield, which is the equivalent to the armor in Doom. It's the spiritual successor to Doom, and its gameplay kind of lasts till today. Although I don't know if people still play Halo Infinite. So Halo might be Doom's adopted grandson, but Doom has a blood grandson too. And he's also named Doom. The 2016 Doom is fire. It's seriously worth playing if you're okay with really loud music and a lot of violence. They brought back a lot of enemies and weapons from the old Doom. They brought back the main character. Was lore now somehow? But this game is the evolution of the Doom formula. It shows that while the level design and gameplay loop of the old game might be a bit outdated, the fast paced and explosive gunplay definitely holds up. I think Doom and Doom Eternal are the most fun I've had playing a single player shooter in a really long time. They took the ultimate boomer game and turned it into this zoomy thing. I'm okay, please ignore that. That came out a lot more cringe than I was hoping. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Doom and then Doom are still the template for how to make exciting and fast-paced single-player shooters. Online multiplayer shooters might not exist without Doom either. We've got two more games to cover today, but I've got one thing to ask you. Subscribe to the channel. Now let's get back to it. We wouldn't have online multiplayer shooters without Doom, but multiplayer shooters today look a lot different than Doom. The games that Doom inspired were games like Quake and Unreal Tournament. They were fast arena shooters. After Quake and Unreal, there came a game that slowed things down and showed that multiplayer shooters could be strategic and methodical. That game is Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike is a weird series. Right now, Counter-Strike 2, CS2, is one of the most played games in the world, but most people are oblivious to the fact that it exists. The first game is 25 years old, but even in 2024, half the time someone wins around, the game says, Terrorists win. I mean, the last time someone said that, you know what, never mind. I'm, let's just leave that joke in the drafts board. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Counter-Strike brought a few major things to the table for shooters. Back when it came out, shooters were a lot simpler. The big games, like Unreal Tournament, were about going fast and jumping and flying around. It was all adrenaline and action and explosions. Counter-Strike is the complete opposite of that. Two teams move tactically and slowly on completing objectives. We'll get more into those objectives in a second. You have to be careful and quiet. Take your time, because if you die, you're done for the round, so you have to play careful. And then there is a big explosion, but only if the terrorists win, and that barely counts. Counter-Strike is also played in a series of rounds. You play half the game as a counter-terrorist, and then you switch to the T-side or vice versa. You also buy weapons in Counter-Strike. There's like an economy in it. This is a little bit complicated to get into and it hasn't really been picked up by many games though, so we could just leave it at that. Counter-Strike has been hugely influential on competitive shooters. Before Counter-Strike, Team Deathmatch was basically the way that you played the game. 
they popularized more objective game modes. You know, the ones that make you uh, actually play the game rather than just camp looking for kills. CS had the first really complex objective in a shooter and also one of the first asymmetrical objectives in a shooter. The terrorists win by planting a bomb and having it blow up, while the counter-terrorists win by that not happening. or either side wins if they kill the entire enemy team as well. Terrorists and counter-terrorists have different guns, so because they have different objectives and different guns, the two sides end up feeling completely different from one another. It directly spawned a few other games and inspired a lot more. It was the first game based in modern warfare between terrorists and non-terrorists, and that would get really popular in the genre later. Valorant is an example of a game that directly copies Counter-Strike. They took Counter-Strike and they put heroes in it like in Overwatch. It plays almost exactly like Counter-Strike with setting a bomb and buying weapons and all that. But sometimes you get hit by a dog and then someone throws out a Pokemon and then another girl flies through the air and shoots a rocket launcher. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. Rainbow Six Siege is inspired by Counter-Strike. It's also a tactical shooter where you only have one life, and it also has one team planting a bomb and another team defusing it. But it doesn't bring much else over from Counter-Strike besides the slower tactical gameplay. The one series that Counter-Strike influenced that you wouldn't expect is Call of Duty. The Call of Duty devs tried to straight up copy Counter-Strike when they made Call of Duty 4, because Counter-Strike was a way bigger game than Call of Duty 2 or 3. However, partway through development, the Call of Duty devs realized that Call of Duty players didn't want to play a tactical game where you only get one life. Call of Duty players like Team Deathmatch, so they made kill streaks as a way to make people want to stay alive, even when they're playing Team Deathmatch. They've updated some maps and some guns, but they haven't changed that much. Counter-Strike 2, which is really Counter-Strike 3 or 4, the gaming industry has kind of forgotten how to count, is doing amazing. It's one of the biggest esports in the world and one of the most played shooters. Counter-Strike might seem like a niche game, but it's done more than its fair share to define the shooter genre. We've covered two different shooters that define the genre, Counter-Strike and Doom. We've only got room for one more in this video, so I want to cover a few honorable mentions and get them out of the way. PUBG popularized the Battle Royale genre and it ended up helping to save shooters. It's just a bit too new and Battle Royales are too small of a subgenre to define shooters in the way these other two games have. It's probably the best choice out of modern shooters, though. Team Fortress 2 innovated the hero shooter. It's just not as impactful as the three games that I'm featuring. Counter-Strike has a larger effect on multiplayer shooters, as has our third mystery game, and Doom did a lot more for the genre as a whole. I want to put a Halo game on the list, but I just can't justify it. It defined an era of shooters, which most games can't say, but it's just not on the level of impact of the rest of these games. Plus, like I said, I think Halo is the spiritual successor to Doom, so it's kind of covered under Doom. You could say something like GTA 3 or 4 or even 5, but these aren't really shooters per se. The problem with putting a GTA game or even a game like Fallout 3 on this list is that the shooting in those games isn't very good. They're better known for the other things they do, so they don't really define the shooter genre. If you think I missed out on a core game that defines shooters, feel free to leave a comment about it. But no, Splatoon did not define shooters. It's time to talk about the third game, and we need to talk about what this game has that the other games don't. There's one game that looms like a mountain, casting its shadows on all shooters today. To explain this, I'm going to steal a metaphor from Terry Pratchett. He used it to talk about the effect the Lord of the Rings had on the fantasy genre of books. The Lord of the Rings became a mountain that appeared in all fantasy after it, like Mount Fuji appears in old Japanese prints. Sometimes the mountain is big and up close. Sometimes it's a shape on the horizon. Sometimes it's not even there at all, which means either the artist made the delivery decision to exclude the mountain, or they're standing on the mountain itself. Basically, almost all fantasy either references or is built on the Lord of the Rings. The ones that don't do it as a deliberate choice. There's a game that fills the same place for shooters, and that game is Call of Duty 4. COD 4 defined the basic shooter. It's the default for what shooters are today, and it innovated in a lot more ways than you'd realize. Seriously, most shooters today take a ton of inspiration from COD 4. Some of these things were done before, but Call of Duty 4 really popularized them. Let's go down the list. Sprinting. COD 4 is a game that popularized sprinting in shooters. Thank the Lord. You used to have to walk everywhere at the same speed in shooters. Sprinting just feels right, and it has a built-in risk-reward system. You sprint, you go faster, but you can't shoot. Perfect. Hit markers. Hit markers are the little things that pop up around your crosshair when you hit something, and they play a little sound. It's such a minor feature, but it feels amazing in-game. This is another one that really sticks out when you play older games. I think that hit markers might be the most important innovation in shooters, but y'all ain't ready to have that talk yet. It adds a ton of juice to the game. If you don't know what that means, check out this video. Leveling up. I'm talking about progression systems in shooters where you level up in multiplayer and unlock new guns and customization. That came from COD 4. No one was doing that before. It gives you so much more of a reason to play the game. You had to grind out to max level so you could unlock all the guns and all the sidearms and all the perks. Leveling up in shooters isn't as relevant all the time now, but pretty much all games have some form of it. Even Counter-Strike 2 has leveling, where you can get cosmetic upgrades by playing more. 
custom class. This also wasn't a thing until COD 4, which feels very strange. In the past, you'd choose different guns, which would all have predefined loadouts. In COD 4, you could actually go in and make your own custom loadout with the primary and sidearm you wanted and pick out the perks to match. This is in so many shooters now. It doesn't really apply as much to BRs, although the God BR has loadouts too. This was revolutionary, and with loadouts came weapon attachments. Again, something that's just easy to take for granted now. Weapon attachments where you can pick out your own sights or put like a laser or grip on their gun, that came from Call of Duty 4. Call of Duty 4 really did create so much of what is considered standard in a shooter now. Like, name one shooter that doesn't have sprinting. Okay, fair. Name two. Whatever, my point still stands, okay? As far as successors go, you of course have the entire Call of Duty franchise. Even 10 plus games later, they're very similar to Call of Duty 4. The Battlefield franchise, which is actually older than Call of Duty, has now taken just about all the things that I listed and added them to Battlefield, and they're in every single game. And in just about every other shooter, you can find different pieces, depending on how far away from the mountain they are. For Apex Legends, the mountain is pretty far off in the distance. It's got sprinting, it's got gunplay that feels a little similar to Call of Duty 4, I mean, it was made by the same people. It's got hit markers, but it leaves the rest behind. The finals, on the other hand, has a summer home near the peak of the mountain. The leveling, the custom layout, the gunplay, the sprinting, hit markers. It even uses a lot of the same guns. But you wouldn't think of the finals as a Call of Duty clone. It's just that what Call of Duty 4 did is so ingrained into the genre that most games can't help but to derive from it. Valorant isn't on the mountain, and it doesn't even have the mountain in view. You can't customize anything but skins, there's no sprinting, there's no hit markers. It deliberately chooses to be something different than Call of Duty 4. Contrast that with Rainbow Six Siege. Both Valorant and Siege are tactical shooters, both of them share a parent and Counter-Strike, but Siege takes a little after its uncle Call of Duty 4, because it has sprinting, and hit markers, and loadout customization. I don't honestly need to go much into the history of Call of Duty 4 itself or the gameplay, it's an arcadey shooter. If you played a Call of Duty game, you're familiar with Call of Duty 4. Honestly, if you played a shooter in the last 10 years, you're actually familiar with Call of Duty 4. Counter-Strike, Doom, and Call of Duty 4 make up the foundation of the shooter genre. All shooters coming out today are either built on or built with parts of these games. We wouldn't even have a shooter genre without them. And all three live on directly in some form today. They are the three games that define shooters. Thanks for watching.